Welcome uh, to the third episode of our 2022 Link and Learn series of webinars. It's, it's great to see so many people here and I'm delighted you can hear me now as well. Uh, feel free to say hi in the chat on the right of your screen. And of course, don't hesitate to ask any questions that you might have for our speakers or our panelists, just add them to the chat. Uh, we're running a poll on today's topic as well, the, lear the learner in the future of work, which you can respond to in the chat. It's the pinned message at the top of the chat. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you from there as well. And I'll be sharing the results uh, just before I introduce today's panel. My name is Ilse Weiss, and I'm one of the uh, learning researchers with Learnovate. And uh, today I am joined by uh, a very interesting speakers and panelists to talk about the learner, which is, of course, not unusual for us. Um, but this today we're focusing specifically on how we're preparing the learner for the future of work. And um, first, we'll be del I'm delighted to welcome Cormac Noonan of Wolf Academy, who, alongside his brother Daryl, have created their own company after a series of personal personal events uh, which really band them together around a special purpose to inspire young people to live happier and healthier lives and become their true selves uh, which is a very noble uh, purpose indeed and then next we'll be hearing from Paula Philpot who uh, of CERC which is the South Eastern Regional College and um, she will talk us through some of the fascinating work that her organization have embarked on with their students which is around embedding project-based learning across the college, which is uh, a key part of their learning and assessment strategy to develop 21st century skills for learners. And we'll finish up today's event with a panel discussion where we'll take a look at the topic from the student, the educator, and a corporate perspective. And we'll be joined by three more speakers from a range of different backgrounds. We have Nicky van der Perk, and he'll be delighted as I'm pronouncing his um, name correctly because we're both Dutch. But he will join us from Polly, who will work with Zoom to who work with Zoom to equip educators with the technology that's required for the classroom experience of the future. Um, and then Mary Kelly will join us from Hibernia College, who do a lot of exciting work around teaching teachers at both primary and secondary level on how to prepare their learners. And then uh, this, our third and final panelist for today is Kira McNamara um, from Folans, who will take part in today's conversation in the panel. And Folans, of course, have been providing education tools to Irish teachers for the last 60 years. Um, as always, we've built in some time for our audience to meet each other in our networking rooms. Um, the networking rooms will open at 1.30 for a speed networking round of about five minutes. You can see the people button on the left of your screen and that will go live at the time where the networking starts. So just to enter the networking area, just simply click on that button and join the speed networking. And it's a great opportunity to, uh, to meet someone new or, well, uh, as this is Ireland, probably somebody you already know but it's always good to have a chat particularly around this important topic and we um, would love you for you to, to answer the following question in your conversations um, what is the one thing that your organization does or intends to do to help your own learners prepare for the future of work. And if there's any interesting insights or any interesting conversations that you've had and want to share, please feel free to add comments and queries to the chat, either to be addressed by the panel or just to share some of the insights of what you've discussed. Um, and just before we kick off today's webinar, I want to give a brief overview of Learnovate and what we do for those who are in attendance today who may not be that familiar with our organization. So Learnovate is uh, based out of Trinity College and we're a research organization with a focus on the future of work and learning. And it's our role to help organizations transform their learning experiences um, and that ranges from students to employees. And our membership model is open to all organizations and the benefits of joining the Learnovate community includes having access to our amazing research outputs as well. Um, we currently have 65 global members from a really wide range of sectors. And um, if you're curious, curious about who they are or want to learn more about what we do as an organization, please visit our website um, to see um, uh, how you can become a member of Learnovate. So that's all the household stuff for today. Uh, let's go back to the business in hand. And I'd like to welcome our first speaker to the stage. Cormac, if you're ready, uh, we're delighted you could join us today. So um, off, over to you. Thanks very much, Ilsa. Um, and hello, everybody. My name is Cormac Noonan, and I'm co-founder of Wolf Academy, along with my brother, Daryl. 
And today I'm just going to be talking a bit about what we do and how we're trying to prepare young people for the future, um, whether that's in the work they do or the lives they live. So Wolf Academy, our mission is to help young people reconnect to who they are. Um, that's myself and my brother Daryl there. So we want to help them become their true selves. And I suppose back when I was younger, I actually spent two years of my life on the streets of Dublin. Now, I wasn't homeless, but I was trying to help those who were. And during that time, I realized that one of the main reasons people were on the streets was due to the trauma that they experienced during childhood. And because of this trauma, a lot of them disconnected from who they were. And this connection from self often leads to mental health problems such as anxiety, depression, addiction, and many others. And I realized during my two years on the streets that people needed to reconnect to who they were. And if we could get young people to really reconnect with who they are at a young age, maybe we could prevent them going down this road in the future. So I knew the solution had to lie in education. So what we do in Wolf Academy, we do talks, workshops, and we have online programs for secondary school students. And as I mentioned, that the aim of these workshops and talks is to share some of our stories and also give them tools to deal with the challenges they're going to face in life. Myself, I kind of went the, the path that society says you should go. I went and studied in Trinity got a degree in business and IT and got a job in Accenture. And after that, I actually realized that this isn't, isn't what I actually wanted to do. I was just listening to everyone around me. I was listening to my, what my friends were doing, what society says was a good job, maybe what my parents wanted. And I never actually listened to what I want. So I decided to head off and go traveling to really discover who I was. And I suppose that led me to, to where I am today. And Daryl, my brother, had a completely different story. After secondary school, he went down a path of alcohol and drug abuse for over 10 years. And that was due to his inability to really express himself and connect with himself. So we came together back in 2020 with the same desire to want to help young people learn from our mistakes and teach them some of the tools that we use on our own journeys and that we continue to use today. So along with some of the problems teens face themselves, schools also face a few problems trying to implement certain wellbeing programs in secondary schools. So first of all, all secondary schools need a full wellbeing program by 2023, as set out by the Department of Education. Um, teachers lack the right skills and resources to really help students. And they struggle with some of the current programs to deliver them, whether they're in books or whatever format they're in. and it's also hard to find speakers that really connect with young people, especially around the 15 to 18 mark. So we've come up with a solution after doing talks and workshops in schools now for two years and having online programs, we've seen the need for a blended approach. And our solution incorporates transformational retreats, online programs, a personalized journal, and three in-person workshops throughout the year. So first off, the transformational retreats. Myself and Daryl have been on many different retreats and it's been a big part of our own processes in terms of becoming who we are. And we see the value in taking the learner or the student out of their normal environment and exposing them to something outside of their comfort zone and challenging them. So they have to go beyond what they thought they could do. It's kind of based on the hero's journey. And once once you do that, once you've gone a bit further than you thought you could and you've challenged yourself and you've overcome that challenge, you have a new sense of yourself. And then when you come back into the, the normal world, the everyday world, back into school, you have this new confidence and this new belief. So that's the first step is really having that transformational experience. And we'll be doing those retreats in nature and um, getting people together around the fire having different challenges. And that's the real important part at the start. And then when they come back into normal life, 
they now they now often have this new inspiration because they want to be this new person they've become and this is where the online programs come in because this is important for the integration phase so we've been working with learn a bit on our online programs we have eight different ones at the moment and they all target different areas depending on the students needs and this is for them to keep developing these skills that they've learned throughout the year next part is the the journal so it's very important to journal your reflections we have goal setting um techniques in our journal what they're learning about themselves and just to keep them on track with their progress uh, it's a very important part of our own journeys as well and it just has proven to to really help in the learning process and then there's the three in-person workshops so this will help us dive a bit deeper to students when we meet them in person to see what areas maybe they're struggling with and um, how we can help them more and help them push past any limiting beliefs any blockages that they have on, the, on their journey and with Wolf Academy, we currently have six coaches going around to different schools across the country, but we're looking to expand and build a network of Wolf Academy coaches to deliver workshops and retreats to schools across the country. And we're looking for people with the right skills, values, and life experience that make them a match that someone with that story that connects with young people and the right values and the skills necessary to be able to deliver the workshops. And then the final part, the puzzle, um, something that we would love to bring in is having our own facility in the future where young people can come after they leave secondary school to really get to learn more about themselves. We call it a growth and purpose year. So a year for them to discover more about who they are, discover their skills, um, develop in mind, body and spirit, and also we believe that you can't know what you want to do until you discover who you are. So we see this as a year out before going to college or before moving on to work to really get clear on who I am as an individual and what's my mission in the world. And we see that also having a campus. So similar to the college experience where they're meeting other people their age and having that community aspect, because that community aspect, we believe, is very transformational and that's where real growth happens is in communities and um, so that's that's our vision with wolf academy and we've we've been in schools across the country as i said and we're looking to keep expanding and if anyone is interested in talking with me after they can always email or look we're always looking to collaborate um, and yeah thanks very much for listening guys Thank you very much, Cormac, for, for sharing that personal story and, and really wonderful uh, program that you have developed. I love I love how there's a focus on continued kind of discovery of who you are as a young person, because it's uh, as, as a mom of a teenager, I can really relate that that's not an easy thing uh, to do or even discuss with your child. So really applaud what you're what you're doing. Um, don't forget um, to add any questions you might have for uh, Cormac into uh, the chat and we'll try our best to have them answered later on. Um, but for now, um, I would like to uh, hand you over to our other amazing speaker, Paula, who is going to talk to us about uh, the project-based learning approach that they have implemented in CERC, which is also a very interesting example of how, uh, how, how they're meeting the needs of the learner. So Paula, when you're ready, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. So my name is Paula Philpott and I work in Southeastern Regional College in Northern Ireland. So you know that the colleges in Northern Ireland merged in 2007 and we went from 20, or about 26, 27 colleges down to six colleges. So we're based in the Southeast area of Northern Ireland. Um, and I suppose just I wanted to take you a little bit of the journey of what we've been doing over the last number of years. So we knew that within the college that there's been a growing body of research that highlighted the gaps between the skills um, noted in a piece of paper, the qualification that learners get and those that were needed for learners to thrive in their learning, um, not just in their learning, but also in life and work. Um, and the Northern Ireland Skills Barometer back in 2019 highlighted that students didn't have um, the transversal skills such as communication, teamwork, problem solving, etc, that they would need um, going into employment. 
Um, and I think during the pandemic, we were also really conscious that students needed to be able to adapt to change in order to thrive in life, learning life and work. And so as a college, we moved to a model that really focused on um, starting from questions. So we know that the traditional model of education is based on logic, language and recall. And I suppose what our focus became was much more one that started around questions that linked the learning very explicitly to the industry that they were coming from or from or to um, society and, and what was of interest to the learners. Um, and seeing that explicit link really became that motivator for change. So I suppose at the heart of it all was that idea of developing the whole learner. So not just thinking about the qualification, the piece of paper that they get at the end, but also the skills, the attitudes, the behaviours and the experience that they would need to really thrive in that environment. So I suppose the first thing we did was look at a PBL model, a project based learning model for us. Um, we adopted a college wide approach, uh, has a really strong link to enterprise and entrepreneurship. So developing the skills, enterprise and entrepreneurial mindset of our learners. Um, embedded within it then is our transversal skills or T-skills as we call it. Um, we support then students taking that entrepreneurial activity through into student companies and also um, looking at the continuous professional development needed for our staff because that was a huge challenge behind it all. So really that future focused pedagogy saw us moving away from a traditional model of education um, and then moving into one that focused on PBL. As I said earlier, that created a big challenge in terms of the skills of staff. There was almost an unlearning that had to happen um, because we knew that within further education that teachers are dual professionals. They needed to be able to um, have the professional and pedagogical skills, but wider than that, to be able to effectively work within that PBL model, they needed to know and understand project-based learning, to be innovative, to be able to cr think critically, to collaborate together, to plan, and to have the digital skills that they needed um, to thrive in that work place environment and at the heart of it all that project-based learning was sort of the core curriculum delivery um, at, at the heart of it and the PBL activities really are really real world challenges where students have an opportunity to um, work collaboratively on a real world challenge um, and that challenge helps them I suppose in a safe space to be able to be innovative but also to um, to be successful but also to learn from things that haven't worked so well and seeing the direct link between their learning and what's happening in the world around them. So for us, project-based learning was really a dynamic approach to teaching, which, as we said, focused on the real world problems and challenges that students had, but also it was active, it was engaging, the students were inspired really to develop a deeper knowledge of their subjects that they were studying. Um, at CERC, we set a number of themes around the learning, um, and that's really helped the teachers as they develop the project-based learning activities for the students. And those themes really encourage both the staff and students to center sustainability at the heart of their projects, but also to harness the digital environment. Um, so the overarching theme, as you can see, is around sustainability, healthy living and learning. Um, but also with, uh, in, in the midst of all that is energy conservation, upcycling, reducing waste, etc. Um, and that just helps, I suppose, shape the projects as we move through um, the year. The T skills, as we've called them, the transversal skills that we've adopted, there've been six main transversal skills, and those are the competencies in which we recognise that employers were needing our students to have, and that would also help those learners, I suppose, thrive in learning life and work. We've really harnessed the digital environment as well because we're mindful of the gap between the value that we put on the process or the approach that we were using within curriculum and the ability for staff and students to be able to operate that effectively. So it's the people, process and systems behind the scenes um, that we focused on. So, uh, oh, that one hasn't appeared for some reason, but it was just a, an example of the digital tracking um, systems that we've developed online to be able to track and monitor um, the activity. So there's a staff uh, interface and then the, this is the student interface. And that T-Skills competence then is displayed to the learners. So they can see how they're developing against each of the T-Skills and helps them, I suppose, continue to develop and enhance those skills as they move through the year working on their project-based learning activities. So that's really a background to it. I should say that we have around a thousand staff. Um, so the scale of what has happened has been phenomenal and actually the benefits to the learners 
Um, in September last year, um, Stromalis College came in and independently evaluated the impact that project-based learning was having on the T-skills of our learners. We had over 4,000 student responses and overwhelmingly they noted the positive impact that um, project-based learning was having in terms of their ability to engage effectively with the curriculum and develop the wider skills that they would need to be able to thrive both in society and in the workplace as they move forward. That's great, Paula. It's such a good example of adopting a new approach to learning and to teaching. And like I know you, you talked through it there in, in, in a few minutes, but uh, that is a massive change process. So kudos to you. I think it's really impressive how this has turned out. And it's great to see that it's 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 bringing you the impact and uh, that you're hoping to uh, get from it as well. So. Um, as with Cormac, if you have any questions for Paula, uh, please feel free to add them to the chat. It's actually really great uh, to hear from and, uh, and learn more about these two great examples. So thank you both for, for your contributions today. Um, so now it's time for all of you to connect uh, through the networking and uh, take an opportunity to share your own insights and learning or questions around the le learning and the future of work. Um, I want to remind you of the question that we'd like you to discuss in your conversation, which is when we're talking about uh, the future of work and learning and specifically about that, what that means for the learners, what is the one thing that your organization does or intends to do to uh, help your own learners? Um, so. Again, if you want to get into the networking, uh, you click on the people button next to enter the networking room and we'll be doing this for the next five minutes or so. And then when we're back, um, don't forget to go back to the main stage when we um, start our panel discussion and share the results from our poll. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. I, I hope you had some nice conversations there. And I know that speed networking always goes really fast. So if you felt you didn't have enough time to finish your conversations, uh, why not reach out to each other after this link and learn to continue talking? Um, as um, I just wanted to share quickly uh, the results of the poll in which we asked you to what extent your organization is ready to support the learner of the future. And uh, while 20% of you feel that they are uh, thought leaders and, and have everything organized about 70 percent of you are saying that there's still work to be done so uh, definitely worth continuing the conversation on this topic which is exactly what we're going to do with our panelists uh, today so i want to introduce you to our panel today i gave them a brief introduction um before so we have cormac and paula who will rejoin us and we'll have kira from folins nikki from polly and mary from hibernia college um as always and i sound like a broken record now but if you want to add your questions to the chat feel free to do so uh, but i'm going to kick off our discussion and hi guys welcome everyone i'm going to kick off our conversation with a question for all of our panelists so um which is what is the biggest challenge that you think you can help solve to propel learners or learning into the future and how would that benefit the learner so i'm opening this up to all of you whoever wants to go first on that one I'm happy to take that if you want, Elsa. Yes, Mary, please go ahead. So I suppose just a little bit of context, Tibernia College is a blended online learning uh, college in existence now for over 20 years. And I suppose what we feel we offer is a flexible, accessible route to people who perhaps weren't previously able to access education. So if I take teacher education, for example, um, and, and we would be the largest provider of primary school teachers, that can be done in Limerick and in Dublin. Um, and, you know, there are people all around the country who want to become primary school teachers and, and we've afforded that opportunity for people to be able to live at home, stay at home and um, be able to study at home, um, but yet get a career. Uh, and I think that's what's going to be needed for the future, that notion of offering alternative pathways, not assuming that everybody wants to be, um, you know, in a, in a university or in a college, in a, a building, so to speak. Um, now, we only deal with postgraduate um, learners, so I think that is important to say as well. But I think that flexibility, that accessibility um, and the, the online piece is, you know, really important. Technology can really enhance learning for people. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that's a, a huge offering that will be uh, required in the future. Thanks for sharing that, Paula. Or oh, sorry, Mary, and I definitely did not disagree with you there, which actually is a nice segue into 
the question around technology and um, Kira and Nikki, I would like to direct that question to you both. And uh, maybe Kira, we can uh, start with you. Um, like, what do you see as the biggest technology trend in your opinion that will improve the learning experience in the future? And then maybe once you're uh, once you're you, you've given your thoughts on that, Nikki, you can uh, you can share with us how how Polly is addressing this um, at the minute. Uh, thanks, thanks, Sarah. Um, so, uh, just just to introduce myself briefly, um, so I am head of uh, digital learning platforms at Folans. Um, so, Folans uh, is probably well known in the Irish market at this stage, um, traditionally as a, a supplier of educational textbooks, and now as more um, blended and digital solutions um, uh, within a primary and a post-primary um, schooling system. Um, so, you know, looking at what, uh, you know, what trends are happening in technology at the moment that will actually impact uh, learning experience in the future. I was thinking that, you know, around, we're hearing a lot at the moment about big data. So, you know, Google's, Amazon's, they're doing this really well. And essentially what that is, is, is doing is it leads to uh, personalization. So when you apply that to the educational space, you're looking at that data in terms of learning analytics and you're getting loads of information about um, how students learn. So, you know, what content gets the most engagement, which content produces the best results. And then when you surface that to the teacher, you put them in a position to be able to adjust what they're, what they're doing for a class or for an individual learner. Um, you know, so, so basically you kind of can create these, these differentiated learning paths so that each learner is, is, uh, is learning at their own pace. And so, I mean, in the first instance, yes, you can give that information to the teacher and they can do it because our teachers are, are, are actually doing this already. But ultimately, you should be able to get to a point where the technology will do it for you. So within, a, you know, a, a, an educational product, you'll be able to create custom learning pathways for, for each student. And it's not just about, you know, it learning at their own pace, but also how they like the information served up to them. You know, so do they actually learn best by by listening to some things? You know, so you you surface up uh, an article as a as a podcast, so the same information just you know transitions into a different way that they would like to process that information. So I think yeah, I think around personalization and each of us learning in the way that we all feel most comfortable is is probably the thing that's that's already starting to happen, and I think we're going to see a lot more of uh, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think using using data to 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 personalize the learning experience is definitely something that is high on the agenda for many educators. I'd say so. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Nikki, do you want to talk a little bit about like what um, what Polly and Zoom are doing um, from a technology perspective to improve the learning experience? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for the opportunity here. Um, um, so you introduced me briefly. Thanks for. Uh, getting my name right in Dutch, so <laughs> first of all. Uh, so I'm based in Rotterdam area in Netherlands, but um, I work uh, here at Poly as a sort of a solutions architect, it's called a technical specialist in the whole uh, EMEA, uh, working a really closely with Zoom to help both schools, universities, but also enterprises to uh, to let the technology work from him. Sorry, Kiara, I, I took that phrase right away from you there because I really like that. I always like the technology to work for you and not against you uh, because I've been in many situations where you need to be in a hybrid meeting or hybrid learning scenario where you can't figure out what the technology does. Um, and Polly, uh, we, we provide hardware uh, and also software to make sure that you are being heard, and being seen, and people can see you and hear you pro uh, clearly, uh, no matter where you're standing. And especially as a teacher or as a learner, um, you want to make sure you are getting the right attention, both from your learners, but also as a learner from your teacher. So you can interact uh, in the right way with each other. I've seen a lot of struggles uh, the last couple of years, especially during COVID, of course, where schools, universities were not prepared to do all that hybrid learning, remote learning, distance learning. It's it's been really a struggle for a lot of uh, a lot of people and a lot of uh, schools and universities. I've seen myself with my own children. Uh, they have been needing to uh, to work or study remotely, which has been quite a challenge. Um, also, Cormac, on your point, it's the mental health on that part it can be really challenging and it's really um, uh, uh, something which should not be forgotten and that interaction between people that should stay and 
we with our headsets and our technology five, uh, things, what we do, we make it try to make it as interactive as possible uh, as we can with these kind of platforms. And I work a lot with Zoom. Zoom is trying to make it interactive with uh, their virtual whiteboard or persistent whiteboard. So you can have just one class, a virtual class set up and have a consistent view on that class wherever you go, but also let the cameras do the work and uh, uh, making sure you are framed correctly as a teacher and myself as I'm presenting, I like to move around a lot and uh, I want to make sure I'm still in frame as a teacher. So you will see the cameras are moving with you and frame that presenter or that talker uh, who is talking at the moment, frame them correctly, right? And uh, we try to let the technology work for you. So. Thanks for sharing that, Nikki, and great to see the quick demonstration there as well of how that would work in practice or give an example of how that would work in practice. And you're right, like it was been a steep learning curve and the hybrid hybrid working and learning is not it's not going to go away anytime soon. So the more we can leverage the technology to help us with uh, making that experience better, uh, the more uh, the better that will be. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to um, uh, ask the next question. Uh, I want to direct this to Mary and Paula because I know both of you have a lot of experience with uh, changing uh, your organization around meeting the needs of those learners. So if you had to make a recommendation to another organization about how they can improve uh, the learning experience of their learners, like what, what would you recommend them based on your own experience of managing these big change processes and providing the options for students and learners. Um, maybe if I jump in first, if that's OK, Mary. Yes, um, Mary, yeah. So I suppose one of the things that we were conscious of was that um, it felt like assessment was driving the curriculum that there was a real strong focus on getting the piece of paper, the qualification. And that it's not to say that that's not important, but there's a much bigger picture about developing the learner that was important to us. Um, and so I suppose looking at the thing that we changed, it was really giving power back to teachers so that they could sit down and really consider what is it that's worth learning and how is it best learnt. Um, because up until then, you know, that each are worried about around 59 awarding bodies and each one had a different requirement in terms of how they wanted information presented and, and the type of activities that students would be engaged in. And so devolving that responsibility or allowing teachers to have that responsibility back again and the power to be able to make those decisions around what was worth learning and how, how they could actually shape and develop the curriculum to ensure that the learners develop not just the not only got the qualification at the end, but really we've given that focus much more on the qualification being a byproduct of the learning, not the driver and the only thing that that um, determines how that class is taught. Um, so I suppose that for me was the change that I would recommend that others did. Um, and it has been so transformative in the culture of the organization, but also in the wider sense around the learning um, and opportunities that students have had and the skills that they've developed as a result. Thanks for sharing that, um, Paula. Mary, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I suppose, you know, something sort of similar, maybe I'd, I'd catch it a little bit in, you know, prioritizing that personal connection. So always have the learner at the heart of everything you're doing and the student engagement is key to anything. So, you know, we are a blended learning, it is 50-50, but uh, as Nikki said, you know, it's technology enhanced learning. When we sit down with our learning designer teams and our, our IT teams, we are it's the pedagogy that drives and the technology follows that and that can only be done I think if you have the learner at the center and realize that relationships 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 whether you're face to face whether you're online um, you cannot get through to learners unless you've established a, a trust creative innovative critical reflective uh, environment like when, when we talk about teaching teachers you know we talk about knowledge skills but also values and dispositions how do you make that person become the true teacher? Yes, I can tell you how to teach maths or I can tell you how to teach science, but how do I give you the values around what a teacher does and how they connect with students, how they communicate, how they collaborate? So I think that if you're really serious about learners, you, you cannot forget that personalization and, and, and the technology has to enhance that and you have to do everything you can. And remember that you know, at the end of the day, whether you're a child or an adult, everybody likes that 
feedback that you know that that word whatever it is um and you can never negate that so uh, you know i i would say whatever whether you're in that face-to-face -face setting or whether in the technology don't lose sight of the the personal experience of the learner in front of you yeah very important like it is all about the learner at the end of the day and i actually want to open up this question to the rest of the panel as well because you all have a host of experience in, in improving the learning experience. So in terms of any recommendations to other organizations, I'd love to hear from all of you actually about what the one thing is that you might recommend uh, organizations do to improve the learning experience in the future. I might jump in here actually, just because from Thank what Paula and, and, and Mary were saying there, it was actually just reminding me of the um, the, the Oireachtas report that's just come out about secondary level um, reform and some really, really nice recommendations coming out in that report, one of which is actually about including the students. So they're planning on doing, um, uh, yeah, what's it called, uh, the, you know, where they, a forum, a citizens assembly forum, where they're actually going to include students for recommendations for what that future curriculum, curriculum should look like. Um, and, and the other thing that they're doing then is just at a very basic level, like Paul, you were talking about, you know, not having the skills or students not having the skills when they when they come or even when they're leaving um, third level institutions that will be suitable for the for the for the workplace. And they're like this seems so silly and laughable nearly, but like they're now actually asking that students would do like an oral presentation using PowerPoint. You know, so like for, for one of the most basic tools that we would all use in, in work on a daily basis. So to actually incorporate that as part of their assessment and do a lot more classroom based assessment as well. Um, so that they would actually be address, assessed on that, which is much more, you know, real, really, in terms of what they would be expected to do, you know, once once they actually have to, to fend for themselves. And also then, you know, a lot more you know, personally fulfilling as well, you know, and kind of again, Cormac, on, on, on the theme that you were speaking on, that if students are actually, you know, more self-determined in their learning and getting to choose their topics and actually, you know, produce content as opposed to just be, you know, sitting there and it's, it's, it's nearly passive, then that is actually, you know, much more fulfilling for the student themselves as well. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, sorry. Go ahead, Cormac. Yeah, go ahead, Cormac. Go on, on that point, with what Kira was saying there, I completely agree with all that. And I think it's definitely just re-empowering the student to really determine like what direction they want to go with their learning and um, whatever that may be. Because when we go in and deliver workshops, we're conscious that we don't want to just be another like teacher kind of preaching to them. And mm. we kind of come down to their level and like try and have that two-way discussion where it's like what's going on for you because there's no point in us you know talking about one topic when like talking about say depression when everyone else in the class is suffering from anxiety so we need to know like what are their problems and what what do they want so it's a two-way thing um, and just giving them that respect that they they know what they want like just believe that like each individual deep down does know like what they're drawn to learn or what they need help with. So um, I think, yeah, just that would be the main one for me. And just as well, having those like online is brilliant, but as Mary said as well, you need to build that connection first. And it's really powerful if you can, can even get some sort of in-person thing going first to really get them connected with you as if you're the teacher or whatever relationship you want to have with them. And then you can move online much easier, I think. So that'd be my couple of points on that. Yeah, absolutely. Very valid points too, Cormac. I think it's 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 kind of teasing out that dialogue between between the learner and the teacher and, and just making sure that learners are heard and like you're saying that they deserve and get the respect to kind of share how they feel, what they think, because there's 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 a lot going on as well. So um there's a question in the chat from Dave um, uh, for for the panel, and maybe Nikki, um, I'm, I'm going to put this one to you first next. But what advice, and he's asking, what advice would you give your 16-year-old learning self to prepare for your current role? Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, uh, I saw the question, or I gave it a thought already. So um, mm. one of the things which I have learned during my career and uh, is always do what you love. and um, for a 16-year-old, it might be um, 
uh, a hard thing to know what you uh, what you love and you need to first recognize what you uh, what you want to do um, but if it doesn't feel right try to do something else which makes you feel right and I think it's also what Cormac said it's you have to first experience things to know if you like it or not um, and if you're doing stuff or having a career which you don't like doing but you need to do it because of xyz reasons it is probably not the right career for you um I've done myself when i was 15 or 16 years old i chose a kind of path in the universe or in school in high school that back then um i quite liked it uh, but it wasn't really motivating for me so um the year after i chose another path which i really liked and which i motivated me and well i got that choice back then uh, stayed an extra year in school but i did what i like to do um, i think that's one of the most important things to basically just do what you like and yeah thanks nikki anybody else want to add anything to that i think you know be open i mean i trained as a primary school teacher um you know and and what i'm doing now is so different to what that training was um but i think along my career i was open to every opportunity i got and i think if we could give young people the confidence to to be open to change and and to have the resilience around change uh, you know i i think you know cormac touched like there there's so many you know young people who are dealing with mental health issues and it's about giving them that resilience empowering them as a 16, 17, 18 year old to, to make choices. I mean, we don't know what world they're going to grow. We don't know what the jobs will be for that. I, I have two and I have a 17 year old and, and twins who are 14. God only knows what <laughs> their world of work will look like. But I hope that we're, you know, giving them confidence to to be open, to try to innovate, you know, to just um, to, to, as I say, to and to enjoy. And I, I think Nikki's point is really, I mean, be passionate, go with something that you're passionate about, because that will sustain you through life as well. Yeah, 100 percent. And as Neve uh, says, most people change their roles seven times in their life. There's a nice statistic for you there. And I'm I'm not surprised, but it takes it takes bravery. Right. And it takes conversation and it takes thinking and kind of really having a, an understanding of yourself to to be able to make those changes. Um, let me see. Uh, there was another question in the chat. Let me just go back to it real quick. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a conversation from Janice. Um, whether the panel have any tips about how to build the connections that Mary was talking that you were all talking about actually, how you build those connections online and how you do that in a in a successful and effective way, I suppose. I can chime in in that uh, if if it's okay. Yeah, sure. So I've I've changed roles uh, twice during COVID, uh, all within Poly, but. Um, first, I was in a local region, so my Benelux, uh, so ben Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg region. Um, the next step was in an EMEA region, so Europe, Middle East, and Asia, um, so or Africa, sorry. Um, but in a lot of regions in that complete region, it is so important to have a first conversation uh, off uh, off -signed, uh, sorry, offline, so uh, meeting people in real life, and th that wasn't possible because uh, well, it happened. Uh, 2020 in mid of 2020 well everybody was locked down everybody worked from home um, during those the past two years i've met so many people's uh, people in the middle east region in africa and in the southern part of europe which i never met before in real life but by meeting them regularly via video uh, using video i think that's one of the critical points there then because you can then see people and uh, look at people in their eye get their interactions and have a good conversation uh, not only about work first but also what, who they are uh, what they do um, to really build sort of a relation there um, just yeah facilitating the uh, facilitating the needs of the needs which you can't do normally online but or which you should do normally offline like eating together with each other uh, having a social conversation those kind of things having those built into your your work conversations with those people that's for me that helped a lot uh, and i've meeting people regularly still from that day and also met a lot of them in person nowadays which is a really good thing seeing them in real life after so long online yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Nikki. Absolutely true. And I think it's 
the technology definitely enables us to have those conversations quicker and, and in, in a way that still enables you to build a personal connection. Uh, Mary, I think I think you were talking about this connection piece in, yeah. in general. So how are you experiencing that? I suppose, in a, yeah, a learning college? From the learner point of view, um, so we gave every student a, a Zoom account at the beginning. Uh, we had just introduced Zoom before we were all in lockdown. So that was absolutely fantastic. We trained all of our faculty very quickly in Zoom, in breakouts, in Woo Claps, in you know Mentimeters, all the different types of apps that they could use to enhance the um, the platform and enhance their their engagement. How to use the breakout rooms, how to bring people back, how to share discussions, use the chat functions. We uh, developed an app for students. It's a so it's a personalized app so that they can set up groups themselves, a bit like a WhatsApp, but it's it's you know connected by the college um, because that's something that they were looking for. Um, and, and I think we also provided what we called digital cafes. So we allowed them a space where the students or the learners could come on themselves and, and just meet for a cup of coffee. We had, after they were out on placements, we held reflection webinars where they would just literally come and, you know, debrief and, and, and just, uh, you know, chat with somebody. Um, we had drop-in clinics where if they were stuck with an assignment, they, you know, could just drop in for five minutes and, and meet with a lecturer. So, I mean, I would think we worked really hard, um, you know, and that was a combination of, of using the technology, training our faculty and and then surveying the students themselves, the learners and what they wanted, you know, so that we, we could say we were actually um, meeting their needs. So it, it was a real collaborative um you know piece within the college where the academic teams and learning design teams and IT teams really worked hard to ensure that um we were providing that that engagement and I think hopefully we were successful uh, and we continue to do it you know it, it is our world and and it's as I said at the beginning I think it's going to be more important so we'll continue to to develop in that area yeah, thank you, Mary. And I think it's really about sort of um, creating like the conditions for those for for those connections to happen from the organization's perspective as well. I think I think students might probably find a way, but it's really trying to encourage them to use everything that's that's at their disposal and just giving them options to to connect and and have conversations around the content or or with each other. Um, Maybe um, Paula, I, I think you, you've got a thing or two to say about this uh, this, this topic of connection as well. Considering your uh, your students are all uh, uh, engaged in project projects and and learning through that, so I, I'd imagine there's a lot of collaboration and connection going on. So I'd like to just bring you back into the conversation and come in as well, because I'd say there's a lot of learning from um, your experience in Cirque on that topic. Yeah, I suppose um, most of us have learned a lot in the last couple of years, no matter what we came into the journey with. Um, uh, I suppose for our teachers' point of view, it was trying to get them, there's almost a default that had happened, I think, across the education sector where people tried to default back to traditional teaching methods because that's felt what, uh, comfortable to them. Um, so there was a lot of work really around um, trying to create that more engaging, interactive learning environment, making sure that there was an opportunity for pause moments for people to build community um, going back uh, to what I think this has been mentioned already and Nikki was saying. But um, but yeah, just creating an environment where people had a chance to to engage with their learning in a range of different ways, to network with their peers because the you know, having observed so many classes during uh, the, the different lockdown stages, um, you know, the temptation was to, to for the teacher to be constantly talking and and um, and really what students needed was that chance to think, space to breathe, to be in that environment and to absorb the information, to process it and to learn. And I think the teachers did that really effectively within the college. Um, we used virtual, we'd been using Moodle as our virtual learning environment coming into the pandemic. And we just moved to ePortfolio completely through Microsoft and um, through yeah, One OneNote, Class Notebook. Um, and we adopted Microsoft Teams as the collaborative platform going in. And that really gave teachers a range of tools alongside the digital tools that they had been using pre-pandemic um, to create more interactivity and engagement. I suppose what was exciting for us was that we had averaged out around 9 million Moodle access hits um, each year. And the, during the pandemic, then we that went up to 13 million. 
which we thought it would go down because we were using Microsoft Teams um, primarily as the platform in which to create the engagement. But I think what it did do was speak to that wider piece about the way in which students wanted to learn and the opportunity to access learning in a range of different formats. Um, but going back to the mental health piece, we created lots of opportunities for students to engage outside of the curriculum as well. Um, I think that echoes what Mary was saying, just how important it was to create space for them to connect with one another, to connect um, outside of just the learning piece, but actually just life. Um, so I think that, that was helpful. Absolutely, and thanks. Thanks for sharing the, those experiences as well. Uh, a lot, a lot to, to to draw from there. Um, I know we're head, we're we're uh, nearing the end of our link and learn today, so I just want to open up um, again once and one last question to you, Ben. See if there's any final comments you want to share with our attendees today. Nope, we're talked out. That's fair enough as well. <laughs> then I'll I'll uh, I'll thank you all for for joining today and sharing uh, what you're doing to improve uh, learn like the experience for learners. I thought it was really interesting to hear from all of you and the different angles that you're coming from. And I hope everybody who is listening today um, has enjoyed that as well. Um, just um, finishing with a few household uh, items again. We'll be sending the post email uh, this afternoon with support materials and a short survey uh, to provide us with some feedback on this link and learn and if there's anything uh, you want to know from the uh, the panelists and speakers I'm um, sure just contact details to be shared there as well um, I just want to finish up with um, um, referring you to our learning inside learning podcast which is in its second season now and we have a really interesting um, a podcast this week that features Nadav Zeimer who's the um, author of education in the digital age and how we're going to get there so they're discussing how students can become co-creators in their own curriculum which i think um would be interesting to people who have attended today's link and learn so i invite you to have a little listen online and if you sign up uh, we'll alert you to the next episode um that's coming out every month so for now again i want to talk, uh, thank everybody um who joined today um our speakers and our panelists and also uh louise who is in the background organizing all of this and alerting me that my um, uh, mute was still that I was still on mute. Um, so uh, looking forward to seeing you for our next Link and Learn, which will probably be September because it's already summer. Can you believe it? So I wish you a very nice uh, long bank holiday weekend for those in Ireland and uh, looking forward to seeing you soon at one of our other Link and Learns. Thank you for joining today. <laughs>